Kane Shepherd here, Pro Life Performance. Talk to us, mate. Can you? What can you tell our audience yeah. about yourself? Yeah. Um, maybe some questions to prompt you would be: Where are you from? When did you come to Australia? Um, who did you play for? Yep. And then I'll ask you a more specific question based off that. Easy. I was born and raised in England. Um, I haven't got much of my English accent anymore. I don't think. Um, and I moved to Australia six years ago. So I was 20 years old. The club I was playing for back in England at the time it was lower level. They called us into a meeting, told us they didn't have much money, we weren't gonna get paid. Um, I said I would stay for a couple more weeks just because I didn't want to leave the coach and, and stuff like that. So I played a couple more weeks and then I had to start looking for a new club. Um, luckily my mum's from Australia. She was born in Perth, so I had a passport since I was a little kid. And I just, I watched the A-League I think a couple of times on TV because we got it over in England. And I said to my parents one day, I said, I think I'm gonna go to Australia and just play football and have a bit of an experience because I wasn't enjoying my football really in England at the time. And uh, six years later, I'm still here, have plenty of experiences. And I remember I spoke to my mum when it was six years and she said, like, I can't believe you've been there six years. I gave you two months and I thought you'd be back. And I was like, thanks mum. So uh, <laughs> she was pretty impressed. That's good. <laughs> it is, it's, uh, I'm sure it was a tough gig coming here and transitioning was it? Can you talk to us more on that or was it easy? Yeah well I put the feelers out to an agent that I knew in England and said do you know anyone in Australia? He said there was a club and I remember it was my friend's birthday I think and we went to watch a concert and uh, we went to watch Drake and uh, love Drake, top man, top man and uh, I got the phone call while I was watching him and uh, they said there's a club, Heidelberg United, they're looking for another striker, they need you there by next Saturday and I was like Right, so I went home, it was an hour drive from where I was, told my parents, and they were like, do you wanna go? And I was like, yeah, why not? So I had a car, had to sell the car, which took a bit longer. But I remember I left on the Sunday, and Saturday night I was laying in bed staring at the scene, and like, what am I doing? Should I do this, should I not? And in the end I just did it because my flights and everything were booked. And then I flew over, and I had a few experiences from Australia in the past, because we came on holiday, my dad worked here for a bit, but I was only like 10 years old. And uh, so I knew a bit about it. And uh, yeah, I flew back, got to the airport and uh, these two men were standing there and they were like, Kane? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and they could have done anything with me. It didn't take me anywhere, but they took me to this nice hotel on uh, Bell Street. And uh, that was it. I was here and I was excited, nervous, whatever. But the next day I was pretty much straight into training and. Just kicked on from there. Awesome. Maybe we can dive a bit deeper into that. What was, you know, transitioning from there to here in terms of football-wise and what came next once you started training? Yeah, well, in England, I had a bit of both experience. I played professional in terms of my scholarship and doing that stuff. And then I played a bit of semi-professional as well, where it was three times a week. And coming here, I knew it was semi-professional. Um, we were training three, three times a week. And I, I knew about the A-League, but I didn't know about the second league. and. I just turned up and I just didn't know what to expect really. So I just gave everything. The first week I was a bit jet lagged anyway and I wasn't meant to start the first game. And I remember one of the boys got injured in training and uh, the manager said to me at the time, he's like, you're gonna start this weekend. I was like, all right, I was half asleep. But, and I played and I played really well. And we won, we played against Oakley I think and we won and I played really well. And um, from that day I just played pretty much every game and just went from there and from then it was an easy transition and the football was, you know, I thought similar to what I was playing in, in England and the life experiences and lifestyle was a bit different in terms of, you know, I moved out of home, um, which I've done in England, but to the other side of the world, um, I moved in, into a little f flat apartment, whatever you want to call it. Um, we had to, we got everything pretty much donated to us from sponsors of the clubs and things like that. I remember there was a guy living on top of the street, it was Path Heidelberg, and he gave us mattresses. Okay. And we were walking with the mattresses on our heads down the hill just to get them in, and then we had to go back and get the other ones, and stuff like that was a good experience. And I think the first two night, three nights, we had to use those little um, candles, tea light candles, because they, yeah, they didn't turn the electricity on. And we were ringing them, and they're like, oh, I'll be done, and they didn't. So we had these cute little dinner together, and I just met this guy, and. We're using tea light candles and everything, so it was uh, it was different, but it was good. It was good. 
It sounds uh, very interesting. Yeah, it was. <laughs> There's a lot more we could probably talk on that. Okay, so what, from that moment, what, what comes next? Did you, how many seasons did you stay at that club? Yeah. Where did you transition to next? Yeah, so my, my goal was, when I came to Australia, was to get into the A-League. Um, I know I had the passport, so I knew that helped me. Um, I didn't know how to get there kind of thing, but I thought, you know, by playing well and doing all that stuff. Um, so I was at Heidelberg for, I think, three seasons. So the first one did really well, the second one did really well, the third one had an injury, um, hurt my knee from a tackle first game of the season. Um, kind of just left it with the physios, we spoke about it, all that stuff, it was my meniscus and medial. And they didn't want me to have surgery to start with, so I didn't do it, but it just didn't get better. Um, I was having a little bit of a sook, and then ended up having surgery, and by the time the season was done anyway. Um, and looking back now, you know, made some mistakes with probably the way I acted and did some stuff and you know what looking back I wouldn't do now which is easy to say but um, after that third season I decided to move on I went to Avondale who were an up-and-coming club in the NPL at the time and they'd, they'd worked their way up from like sixth division I think in Australia so I went there and um, to be honest my confidence was, was really low but the coach really liked me he played me every week so I was very grateful for that, but my confidence in that was pretty much on the ground. I hadn't played for a year. At the time, I didn't know how to build confidence or self-belief or anything like that. I was basically just being a bit of a sook and just feeling sorry for myself and stuff like that. And realistically, looking back on that season, I could have scored 15 goals with the amount of chances I stuff I had as a striker. Um, but because I was feeling sorry for myself and stuff like that, uh, I scored three. Sure. Um, Can I ask on some of those things? So yeah. you said one of the things was something I'd do a lot differently. Yeah. Is that specifically to that injury and to that identification, being able to identify and get surgery sooner? Or is yeah. it related to what specifically? Like what would you do differently? Um, the injury, moment? yeah. I had another incident just recently, last season, where I hurt my foot. And I had the same thing. They said you can wait and see if it gets better or just have surgery. I decided, made the decision just to have surgery because of my experience of what happened before sure. um, and then just stuff mentally as well in terms of doing things differently, handling myself differently. Um, I suppose the way that I was treating myself and other people because I was being a sook and, and things like that as well. So uh, a bit of both really. Sure. Can I interject on that? So from a performance yeah. coach standpoint, yeah. a lot of players that we work with will have an injury, for example, mm -hmm. and they'll get a, a recommendation or they get some advice where people say operate straight away. Yeah, I've always been a coach who will say get multiple yeah. diagnoses, speak to different professionals like specialists, um, you know, sports doctors to make sure that you're making the right decision because yeah. sometimes having the surgery is the right answer. Yeah. And the sooner you do it, the sooner you recover. Yeah. But also with that being said, sometimes it's not the right answer because people are very quick to operate yeah. and you can rehab them. But if you don't rehab it correctly or it doesn't bounce back, you can spend an entire season and it's still niggly, it's not right. You could have just had the operation and been back in yeah. six weeks' time. So it's a very interesting, highly debatable topic. And the best advice, as, as, as you just said, would be to speak to the, the specialist yeah. and then probably just get it done properly from the get-go. Um, and multiple... Opinions. Multiple opinions. That's well. the case. Yeah, multiple opinions. And I think at the time I was still young, so I was only still, what, 21 or so. And I was young and experienced, and I never had to deal with that situation before. And essentially I was on my own, so I was getting um, opinions from the specialists and stuff like that. And I suppose sometimes it's a gamble, you know, there's benefits and risks of, of both and stuff like that but when it wasn't getting better and I started to train again I was just making it worse because I just wanted to get back and play and I was like it should be better by now and it wasn't and then yeah it was just a spiral effect um, but yeah at the end of the day I think the biggest thing for me as well is the second time I learned I've got to do what's right for me and what feels right like you can get all the opinions but the second time you know I just said no nah, I want the surgery I'm getting it done now and that's that's the end of it so but that was having more experience and, and going through it as well. I guess you have to go through these things to understand them and to be able to yeah. make your own your own call. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, we've all been through, in talking football specifically, a world of different experiences and often it's the negative experience that gives you the tools to then make the change or correct it, whether from a coaching standpoint or your own decisions. 
Yeah. Talk to me more on the confidence. So we put out questions and polls to all of our audience often and 90% of the time there's always a confidence thing. Yeah. How do you improve confidence? What you know? What is confidence? How do I become more confident? So if your, tra- your transition from Huddleberg to Avondale and yeah. your confidence was diminished and yeah. you said you could have scored 15 but only scored three, can you talk to us more on that? Yeah, and I mean, so in the middle of that season, uh, Avondale had only scored three goals, but there was an opportunity for me to go play in Finland. I had to go trial, and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go do it. So I flew over there, trained for two weeks, and they ended up signing me. I did really well. I played a couple of games as a number 10, did really well. Um, but the coach got sacked, new coach came in, and um, they offered me a new contract, but it was like really low to pay for like the reserve team, this and that. I didn't want to, couldn't do it like financially as well. Um, and basically, I had to make a decision. Do I want to carry on like pursuing being a professional footballer or was I just happy to go and play you know, semi-professional footballer and then go get a job or whatever? Because I knew that was an option I had in England or, or Australia. Um, so I had to make the decision. And to be honest, I sat in my room on my own in Finland. I probably cried a couple of times. I was on my own, um, all that stuff. And I made the decision. I, I still wanted to be a professional footballer but I had to figure out what it was that I really needed to, to work on. And the confidence was one of those things. So essentially I had to, I moved back to Australia and I had to find like a sports psychologist pretty much and work on that. And still to this day, I'm still working on it. And the second time I went back to Avondale, I had my best season and I scored 20 goals in 26 games, just cause I built on that confidence and mm-hmm. Um, I was in the gym, I was doing all the right things and I just felt different. So it comes down to the education. So you yeah, knew you were aware, firstly aware, yep. um, you had to make a tough decision. And yep. I think for a lot of our listeners and footballers everywhere and people everywhere, there's always going to be that fork in the road where you need to make a decision. Are you yep. all in or are you not in? Yep. How bad do you want it? What are you going to do to make it work? And with that being said, there's not a problem of being a semi professional footballer. Yeah. If you love the game and you're passionate, you can by all means play NPL and still earn a good wage. Yeah. You can still get five hundred to twelve hundred dollars a game. Yeah. Which is a lot of money. Yeah, it um, is. Whether you choose to work on top of that or not, it's up to you. Yeah. But the decision, we all face the decision. Um, we'll face multiple decisions and yeah. you've just got to navigate what you want and, and make it work. So I didn't know that about Finland. No, I was only there for probably six months. So I went halfway through their season. Um, and again, yeah, I could have stayed. And I went back to England to see my family. And um, I went and trained with Yeovil Town for like two days. I drove down there. I brought my mum's work van. Drove all the way down there. And I was just there. I just really didn't enjoy it. And I just and I still had my, my girlfriend in Australia at the time. So I hadn't seen her for like six months because she couldn't come over. And uh, I just said... I'm going back to Australia. I need to, you know, go and enjoy my football again and figure out really what it is that I want to do. And it was kind of the same when I left England the first time to come to Australia. You know, I mean, I listened to the podcast and Dom talking the other day about, you know, you give so much to football and being a professional footballer. And I was so professional in England, I didn't do anything. Like school, I didn't play for school sport, any any school, school sport. Um, I didn't drink, I didn't go out, I didn't see my friends. I was always just training, doing everything. Um, and when I first moved to Australia, actually the first four months just went out all the time. <laughs> like big, big city, uh, everyone knew where to go, all that stuff, and I experienced it. Luckily for me, I didn't enjoy it that much. And I was like, this is really affecting my football. And uh, again, I had to make those big decisions. Like, what is it I really want to do? And luckily for me, I've made the right ones and I'm still able to to play football as well. Yeah. Absolutely, I feel like there's something I'd like permission to speak through and I'm yeah, going through, but of course. something I wanted to touch on when Don did the interview, it was almost, I got the vibe where it was like, oh, now you're drinking and now you're partying and, and there's yeah. different types of people and different people have different outlets. Um, I'm not saying that drinking is bad or good. Yeah. Um, we know that excessive drinking is very bad. <laughs> but if you're an elite level athlete, yeah. don't, don't be shy to be an elite level athlete. Don't be shy to not go out yeah. or not have the urges to go out and socialize and drink and do other things that other people do because in order to be that 1% or that 0.5, 0.05%, that's what it takes. You know, if you need to be healthy and put yourself into that basket, and focus on different things as long as your support network and the people that you 
associate with uh, on similar levels yeah. and interests, you don't necessarily need to do that type of stuff either. Yeah. That, that was just my input. That's the hardest thing, like you said, you didn't see your friends and stuff. Yeah. If you have friends that are doing that type of stuff, then they influence you or they're like, oh, why aren't you coming or stuff yeah. like that. So it adds a whole other layer of pressure. Yeah. So then I was the exact same. So I removed myself from that environment completely. Yeah. So then you didn't have that added pressure to go and do something you want to do. Um, that's super relevant now, especially in today's society. There's yes. so many options to do everything. <laughs> and in Australia, it's so accessible. It's so easy. Yeah. So you get dragged here and there. And, you know, if you're not <clears throat> like you were, super, super focused and you can go off track. Yeah. But I think finding that balance is, is very important. Like, I feel like people who watch this or watch what you were saying, like you were saying, people think, oh, now he just goes out and he drinks and does everything all the time. Whereas it's not, it's about finding that balance. Because I found now I have a balance and I have friends and I go see them and I hang out with other people and I take my mind away from football. When I go to football, my mind can be there more often. Because when you think about it, 24 7 it's so it's draining extreme, correct and i remember yeah. you said it the other day it's just so draining and you know you see all these footballers come out now saying they're studying they're doing this they're doing that because yeah. football doesn't last forever so give it everything you've got to become a professional footballer but to have that balance i think is very important and it's helped me a lot and just even you know when you are injured or things like that as well to have a bit of a balance instead of just shutting yourself off and being aware for me it's it's massive and I think again it's different in England to Australia as well so I think there's there are differences absolutely um so you touch on there it's a huge 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 thing which we can go into a whole nother episode <laughs> and discussion but sacrifice yeah um and you did cover it very well and like you said the thing that Don spoke about is covered very well in order to get anywhere you have to sacrifice something um so oh, 100%. can you, if I just say the word sacrifice? Sacrifice. The first thing that comes to my mind is family because the amount that they sacrifice for us, my parents, my brother, you know, drove me everywhere around in England um, to go anywhere I wanted, to get everything I wanted, to give me the best opportunity to, to play football. Um, and I sacrificed a lot myself. Um, you know, I was just football, football, football. And even when I was at school, I was like, I can't bother to do school work, I want to go play football. But then when I was 16 and I was going for a scholarship and they said, well, to get this scholarship, you actually have to have these grades from school. And my dad looked at me and was like, you better start <laughs> listening and doing some school work. I was like, yeah, right. I was like, and that's that balance. I think, you know, actually and people go, oh, school's not important or whatever. It is important, but having that balance of school, friends, you know, and there's a lot going on all the time. But if you can, if you can find it, I think, it's a big one and yeah, family I suppose is the biggest thing that comes to me for sacrifice and I know you guys are exactly the same and, and things like that and it takes a toll on them as well. Yeah. Um, I know for me, when I moved away to Australia, like my mum and dad, my brother, they miss me so much but I feel like my mum and dad started to have a better relationship. They spent more time together, you know, they do more things together and all that and that's a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we've we quite similar. So we're, or I presume it's going back a long, long time ago, but we were close before yeah. Dom, um, our sister moved out at like 13 or 14. She yeah. moved three hours away to a school to, to do a dance academy. Yeah. So she studied school and dance and it was three hours away from home at 14. Dom moved out at 16. Yeah. Um, so our family and dad moved with Dom. So we were all separated. Yeah. And we spent 90% of our you know, years over the last six years apart from each other, but our love and connection grew stronger because you value the sacrifice, you value yeah. the time that you do get to spend with those types of people. So yeah. I think, again, to a positive outlook, it can make things a lot better as well, yeah. um, despite being super, super hard and missing a good portion of their, their life. Um, but that's what it takes. Yep. Um, school, I don't know if this is a topic for today, but school, a lot of our clients are you know, 12 to 16. And almost with all of our clientele and the parents, mm -hmm. we talk to parents about school and some parents are, nope, our child can't play football until they finish school. Our child can't go overseas and trial until they finish their HSC or their, what's the Victorian, um, VCE? Yeah, yeah um, VCE, yeah. 
<clears throat> before they finish school, they can't become a footballer. And there's all this stuff. I presume this is a topic for another discussion. What's yeah. your thoughts on that? Would you say anything to parents or two players in your own opinion and speak freely? I think, again, it's all about balance. But I think the parents have got to be careful in terms of, you know, making decisions for their kids. Um, you see a lot of parents want the best for their kids, whatever it is, whether it's school, football, whatever they do in life. But I think they've got to be careful they don't limit them in a way as well or, you know, make decisions and choices for them. Um, and they're big decisions and big choices, but at the end of the day, the kids have got to make their own decision. And school is important, but, you know, you can go and study throughout your life all the time. So, and football, again, it's the same. You can go wherever and there's always solutions. It's not just, no, you can't do this because of this. I think there's always solutions. Um, I was probably, you know, my parents wanted me to do well at school, but I was so into football, you know, they were just like keeping me going along at school. Um, and looking back now, I, if I went back, I would do a lot better. Um, and I think, you know, School does teach you a lot. There's some things they can do better, but I think parents have just got to be careful, you know, that they don't start making decisions for their kids because yeah. when they grow up, essentially the kids are not going to know how to make their own decisions and do that as well. Yeah. What's your input, Dom, in terms of school, based on what you learn at school, based on what you've learned outside of school as a mature age student studying, um, what do you find from that? Um... So as you said, Kane, you can learn throughout your whole life. So I'm 26 now, I'm still learning, I'm still studying now. Yeah. But a lot of kids don't know what they actually want to do and study until they you know, had a gap year after year 12, yeah. for example. Yeah, so then you're 19. So as a footballer, your football career, it's so small. Yeah. It is so small. So we have the clients that have sacrificed opportunities overseas because of school. But if your kid's at a level to potentially go to Spain or go to Europe and to make it right now, yeah. don't miss the opportunity. Like it's it's a it's a shutting door moment potentially. You know yeah. what I mean? It's a sliding door moment, sorry. So as you said, you can always you can continue to study, you can find out other avenues and other ways around it. And if you're gonna to go to a big club, they're gonna help you study as yeah. well. Okay. So the development of that development of actually moving overseas as an individual besides football is gonna help you learn so much as well. It's not yeah. just about school. So if you're going to miss an opportunity just to stay in Australia to study, yeah, it's to me it's crazy, especially yeah. if you're at the level to really go yeah. somewhere. Because if you don't go now and you're 14, 15, 16, and in a few years' time you start to grow, your body changes and your development doesn't go as continue along the path that it should. Because Australian coaches potentially, you know, aren't going to provide you with the skills, yeah. then you've missed the opportunity to become professional football. Yeah. So it's very individual based, Potential. obviously. Potentially, yeah, of yeah. course, and I, it's individual based. I um, and being a person that was never fond of school, mm. and no disrespect to all of my previous teachers <laughs> and, and the programs and the system, but I just hated school. Yeah, I, I'm not a person. I presume this is why I run my own company and work <laughs> with the people that I choose yeah, to yeah. work with and do it in a fashion that I see fit. But I didn't enjoy having to conform to a style of learning or a style of input and yeah. all that type of stuff. Long story short, I pretty much flunked school, dropped out at year 10. Thank, thankful mum and dad actually forced me to do 11 and 12 because I was too immature to be outside in the workforce. Long story short, I didn't learn much from school. I didn't, that didn't suit me. I, yeah. I could have done something else creative. It took me a very long time to figure out what I wanted to do. And what I've learned outside of school through my own studies, through yeah. my own practice, through being a person and trying to explore opportunity is tenfold. Yeah. Um, you know, I spent $60,000 at university yeah. to learn 3% of what I know now, what I've taught myself through experience and through self exploration. Yeah. So don't be necessarily governed by the system yeah. or by VCE or by HSC because there's more ways to skin a cattle, there's more roads to roam. Yeah. I think that goes back to what Dom says about yeah. the individual. Um, but I think, yeah, going back to the parents, they just gotta be careful because each person is different and they might have three or four kids and they're all going to be different as well. So you yeah. can't have the same strategy for each kid. One might be really good at school and they might have that pathway, but then someone might be like yourself who learns better from just being out there and experiencing stuff. And I think you just got to look at it and deal with it a bit better and just saying, this is what you're doing, this is what you have to do. Because I feel like that builds a bit of, res not resentment, 
kind of resentment and they just do what they want anyway. So being able to talk to them a bit more about it and give them that, I don't know, to be able to be grown ups and talk about it, I think is a lot, is a lot better. Yeah. Very interesting. And I think something that Dom said as well, we've, we've had a few times happen where children or players are ready. They're, they're at a great spot to have an opportunity to be seen, be selected, yeah. whether here or abroad. And it's just that fear element or perhaps there's not enough education around, yeah. you know, going over there is not going to actually hinder schooling or their education or their development. Yeah. Uh, it's probably going to make it tenfold as a person, as despite, a person yeah, despite the player. So, yeah. 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 That's usually going to come up if they're moving overseas, but obviously there's a heap of sacrifice involved for parents, which yeah. is as equally important as their schooling. Like, yeah. can the family actually move over or can they afford to all that yeah, type of course. stuff? They don't have a passport, but yeah. Just, like you said, keep the parents have to keep an open mind, yeah, and have that dialogue and conversation. Um, yeah, but there's no education around this stuff, so no, there's nothing. Well, I know for a fact when I moved to Australia, my mum was like, Yeah, go go for it, see what happens. You know, if you like it, stay, if not, just come home. Yep. That's the worst that can happen. If you need help, we'll help you. My dad was like, Oh, I don't know if he should, he should go and all this. And my mum just said to him, Let him go, see what happens. And yep. you know, they let me made that decision and I think they realized it was time for me to make those decisions for myself and you know they've given me everything and provided me every opportunity that I could need or want but I think they realized it was time for me to go and do it by myself and you know if it worked out it worked out if not they would have been there for, to support me and you know take me home if I wanted to and, and things like that as well so and that's the thing you can always come home right like, yeah that worst case scenario no matter how far you go you can always come home yeah um, so what, you know, what's the risk, if that makes sense? If you fail, yeah. start again, come home. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. You're always going to learn in failure. So you're going to learn something. <laughs> yeah, you're going to learn something, what that is. If you fail in football, you become a better person, potentially. So. Yeah, and that's one of the biggest things moving to Australia. I moved out of home in England, but I was still only an hour and a, wa- an hour and a bit away from home in England. I could bring my mum and dad whenever. You know, the time difference over here, they're sleeping, I'm doing something during the day, and I'm like, well, I can't bring my parents to do it. I've just got to go do it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's not going to get done. So I just have to learn that way. And then, you know, you build those habits to just go and do it, get it done yourself, talk to people. And at the end of the day, I didn't have a choice because if I didn't do it, I didn't have food, I didn't have, you know, money, I didn't have, <laughs> I couldn't live. Yeah. So it's either, well, you just go home and just whatever, which not a problem if that's what you want to do, but I didn't want to do that. So I just had to get on with it and you know I know we always speak about it but the person first and then the athlete second yep. so as a person I had to grow and my mum you know your mum's probably the same but you're a little boy and she sees you grow up and sees a difference in you and and, and it's good so yep. absolutely next question this yep. is what I think everyone wants to know myself included is yep. the transition from semi-pro to professional yeah um, and I'll just leave it at that what can you tell us about it how does it feel taste look smell yeah so I was at Avondale and I was having the best season I probably had I had scored that 20 20 goals in 26 games I really wanted to get to the A-League that was my goal I was clear on it I was playing really well doing everything right we would do playing the FFA Cup as well um, done really well in that um, but I didn't really have anyone to like, talk to A-League clubs for me so I just started messaging people myself well, I went on to Victory's website on LinkedIn and just added people, messaged them. And that's what happened with Newcastle. I added the CEO on Facebook. He accepted me. I got excited like a little kid, like you do. I sent him a message. Um, he didn't reply. And I was like, mm. so I messaged other people. And then I had a little video made. And then the video was made. And then we played the FFA Cup game. It was on TV. I scored a good goal. The next day I sent him the video. And uh, he saw my name pop up and he recognized me from the night before. So he watched it. He said, can you call me? Send me his number, whatever. They played a game in Melbourne. I went to meet him, met the manager. And um, then they were like, can you come on for this week on trial? I had to ask Avondale, they were fine with it. They were good about it. So I went there and um, apparently I found out that I already booked, but I had to wait a two week period to go on the trial. And uh, apparently the manager watched some more of my stuff and he said, oh, I don't want him to come on trial now to the CEO. And the CEO basically said, well, he's already booked his like, flights and stuff like that. It's 
not costing us anything. Just let him come train. If you don't like him, then we won't sign him. I trained four days, played a game, and the manager turned around and said, well, I nearly made a mistake there. Sign him before he leaves tomorrow. So I was there for four days, um, signed, and then came back to Avondale, played the rest of the season, moved up there. And that was only probably three weeks from moving from Melbourne to Newcastle before the season started. So I was match fit, but it was getting up to match fitness for the A-League. So in NPL, you know, you maybe sprint every so often there. It's just, you know, the fitness level was the biggest difference. Um, technical, because they're so used to being fitter and stuff like that is you can see the difference, but I felt like I could do it. And then I did it and I've been there for the last two seasons. Yeah. So just, just going back a fraction. So the manager nearly didn't yeah. sign you just yeah. based off your video and, and, and an assumption before the opportunity of actually seeing you in person. Yeah. So he has the style that he wants to play. Yeah. And obviously I put myself forward as that position or striker. Um, and he likes his strikers to, you know, play on the last, last line of defense, run in behind. Um, and then I went, he must have been watching that. And I, my game is coming to feet, dropping into pockets, getting turned, you know, running with the ball a little bit, passing it, getting in the box and, and doing all that stuff. And um, the way I see it is he looked at me as that number nine was, wasn't was the way that he wanted me to play for him. Sure. Because everyone has their own styles and yep. fair enough. Um, but in the game, he actually played me in a completely different position. I played on the right and I actually just came inside as like a number 10. And honestly, I should have scored five goals, hit the post, the crossbar, scored in the end. And after that game, he called me over and said, I'll sign you. So, Because you're a 10, aren't you? <clears throat> Matt, preferably. Preferably as a 10 second striker, yeah. um, coming to feet. I can play on the right, coming inside as like an inverted yeah. player as well. But I like to get on the ball, be creative, yeah. create chances, assist, score. And, and do that stuff as well. And of course, defend. Everyone loves to defend. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you see, opportunity dictates success. Like if he, yeah. if you didn't get to be in front of him, then yeah. regardless of whatever you're seeing, he's already made his decision. Yeah. So it's what we preach is, if you don't actually have the opportunity, how are you going to know? Like yeah, you're not going to get to the level. So you've got to put yourself <clears throat> or yeah. get given the opportunities. Yeah. There's a bit of a theme here for me that I'm picking up on. Resilience. So your resilience as a person, you know, yeah. you've messaged all these people, you've taken it upon yourself to find the opportunity. Like they say you can build a door, but you know, or open a door for someone, but they have to walk through it. Yeah. So without you persevering and not yeah. taking no for an answer and chasing down these coaches, the opportunity would have been there. So. Yeah, well growing up in England, the South that we were in, we had some great coaches and they were all about the person first, you know, learning how to look after yourself and just little things like you always had to clean your own boots, you had to pack your own bag and do all that kind of stuff from a very young age, like eight years old. Um, and that really built up like just life skills and personal skills for me to be able to do that. And then we always used to have talks with professional footballers in England that he knew and things like that. And they used to tell us stories about, you know, I used to rock up to a training ground with my boots and ask for a trial. And we used to sit there and go, oh, that's really cool. And I used to sit there and think, that doesn't happen. <laughs> like, that's, that's not happening. You didn't just rock up and all this stuff. And obviously it changes a bit now because of security and all that stuff. But when I started messaging people and it happened to me, I was like, maybe it does, maybe it does happen. And, all, all stuff like that, so it's... I think that's massive for any of the people who listen to this, all of our younger clients, because, yeah. again, communicating with parents, figuring out what's what's happening and having that ear close to the ground, our clients won't even talk to their coaches. There's like this... Yeah. I don't know what the right terminology is here, but sometimes coaches don't communicate with their clients, yeah. with their players, and I think the whole fear element and that old-school authoritarian coach... Yeah. It works for, for some people, but for me, from an education standpoint, it's not good enough because if you've got your own players scared to talk to you and open a communication line, then how is everyone getting better? So what I mean by that is our players won't even ask our coach, you know, can I go on trial with the 20s or can I go on trial with the senior team or have a session and those types of things. So if there's not that resilience or confidence or attitude around, you know, going to ask for what you want, then I guess the question is how bad do you actually want it? So you're going to have a bit of a backbone and with all due respect to people listening, you're going to have that confidence or 
what's the word I'm looking for here to actually go and introduce yourself. If yeah. you want it, go and get it. But I think that also comes down to the education side of things as well, because we're going to talk about this about more down the track, but you know, we, we get our beliefs from our environment from a very young age. So without really knowing what we're doing, you know, that might have been built up from somewhere else and you might not have the confidence there. So perfect example is I lost my confidence, whatever, whatever happened. I didn't know why it just happened at the time. But my dad always used to say to me, you need to be more confident more often because when you are, you're unstoppable on the pitch, but it's not consistent enough. And I used to look at him and say, well, how do I do that? And he used to go, I don't know, just do it. And I'm like, okay, that doesn't really help me. And we just used to go back and forth like that. And, yeah. and it's like, well, that consistency is a thing that probably let me down most in England um, before I got back from um, Finland as well. And I couldn't figure it out why. So I had to... Yeah, make that decision and find out what it was that I actually needed to do to, to go and do it. Now, if you have a player that is, you know, worried or scared about going to talk to a coach or something like that, they need to figure out why. Yep. Instead of just going, I can't, I can't, I can't, because the more they say that, the more it's going to scare them. Correct. But if they can figure out why it is and come aware of it, like you mentioned earlier, and then go, okay, well, this is what I need to do, and then go <coughs> do it, I think it'll be... I think there's two different um, there's two different aspects as the parents and yeah. the coaches. Yeah. So the parents like your dad, he didn't know, yeah. which is not his fault. Yeah. And probably nine out of ten parents right now in this world that we're living in, exact same position still. Yeah. So our dad was exact same. All we used to say was just work harder. Yeah. <laughs> Push harder, keep pushing, which is what he knew. Yeah. And still knows. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the thing that he used to do with us was in terms of our coach, he always used to say to me go and ask him what you can improve at. Yeah. And I used to hate that. I was like, <laughs> how am I going to go? Like, that's a, That makes me cringe. I don't want to ask my coach, oh, where can I improve? Yeah, yeah. He used to make me do it every three to <laughs> six months. Yeah. You know? But he been instilling that confidence to actually do that. And once you do that, yeah. take that first step to make that first conversation, yeah. it becomes easier and easier. Yeah. But then on the flip side, the coach wasn't really used to that. And he didn't yeah. know how to communicate to me, yeah. you know, or, yeah. or give me the tools to be able to do that before my dad forced me to do it. And that's what you said. Question for you. The coaches have to. Yeah. So once you started doing that, did that become easier? Yeah, of course it becomes yeah. easier. It's always going to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Like so having it because it's a realistic conversation about your own game. It's like, shit, I'd actually don't yeah. hear that. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the, co- the biggest thing for me is the coaches from MPL all the way to juniors, the under sixes, they don't give players confidence to be able to have an open conversation or they don't provide them the platform to... Yeah be educated from them it's just like it's it's insane and it needs to change like that's the yeah. biggest part the best example i've got for you i was eight years old i just signed for a center of excellence northampton town playing my first game so excited my dad's standing on the sideline he tries and tells me what to do so he says something to me and i'm turning around i'm looking at him he's talking to me the coach calls me over says come here so he calls me over says sit down he goes do you know why i pulled you off i said no nah. He went, tell your dad I'm your coach. Tell him not to say anything ever again. I was like, wrong. And then came to Australia, did some coaching, the complete opposite. The coach was standing there. He had all eight parents around and I'm like, what's going on here? I was like, I can't handle this. Like, But again, I think there needs to be that balance. You know, Don't get me wrong, I don't think parents should be telling their kids what to do on the pitch. Firstly, it distracts them from what they're trying to do. Yep. Um, secondly, they have a coach for a reason. But, you know, if the coach, I mean, the parent, if he wants to approach the coach, they should be able to communicate as well. Absolutely. It shouldn't be just the kid has to talk to me only because yep. that's how we were brought up. Like, if something's going on, the kid only talks to me. Yep. Whereas sometimes, you know, the kids are still maturing and you want them to learn, but sometimes, you know, the parents need to be able to talk to you as well. So, I th- again, I think there needs to be that. Be that bad. So saying that, my dad never really said anything again after that. So he, just, <laughs> he just waited till we got home. <laughs> I think talking about football as a whole and Australian football and yeah. the the we've got massive, massive issues. There's some great things, but there's a lot of things that need to be changed and you know improved. And it comes down to education. So I think the balance, the balance or that equation between coach, parent, player, that that yeah. tripod, yeah. that triangle, is something we haven't got correct yet because it's either the the academy coach doesn't say anything, arms crossed, parents can't come near me, I'm too yeah. professional, Yeah. which I don't believe in either. Yeah. 
because there is no communication, or it's the parents are telling their children what to do <laughs> going against the coach. So I don't think we've got that formula right just yet. Um, that's a whole other topic. Okay, talk to, the, <laughs> talk to us yeah. more. So that, that big opportunity dictated your success. Yeah. You were match fit, you were ready, you took that opportunity and you got your spot. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us about the opportunity, how you felt in that moment, and then can you tell us a bit more what happened after that? Yeah, I was pretty excited because I signed and my family were here from England at the time. So they were here when I signed, which was really cool. Um, moved up there, got settled, did all that stuff, and then the season was, like I said, pretty much about to start. And um, I was on the bench for the first few games, came on, made my debut, pretty nervous, all that stuff. Um, Went uh, really well, apart from my debut, VAR gave a penalty against me. Did it? Yeah, Wellington, Wellington <laughs> away. Yeah, got brought on and then something happened in the penalty area, the guy fell over and like, we carried on playing, the ball went out, whatever, they stopped and the ref gave me like yellow card and gave a penalty. I was like, I've been running debut. on my debut. And uh, yeah, afterwards I looked at the man and was like, Thanks for my debut. <laughs> we lost 2 1. <laughs> yeah, so, but after that, it was good. I played in the Asian Champions League as well, qualifiers, which was really cool. Played against a team from Asia somewhere. <laughs> and uh, then we played uh, against Kashima in um, Japan, which was really, really cool. And I always remember that because the coach at the time, he was telling us, he was showing us videos because you always watch videos, look at the other team, all that. And he was like, right. Watch this video. This is how they play. This is how they pass the ball out. So we all start watching this video on the big screen and um, we all look at each other and we're like, they're playing against Real Madrid. And they're in the corner like, of the box and they just pass it around and like, Real Madrid are not even there. Really? And he's like, I want you to defend against that. And we all look at each other like, quality. You <laughs> can't wait. <laughs> we're actually doing right. I think we lost 3 1. Okay. Um, so we didn't get through, but it was still a very, very good experience. So, and then I got through that. I played. 33 games all together, I think. Um, eight starts, I scored three goals, four assists, did well. Went away for pre-season, came back to Melbourne, got really fit, lost I think like four kilos. Um, did that, went back to pre-season and just before season started, got a rare injury from a tackle. And uh, going back to what I said earlier, I decided to have the surgery. And then that put me, put me out for three, three, four months. So, didn't play much this year. <laughs> yeah, very cool. Um, in, in just to conclude, you know, speaking about your career and stuff, yeah. is there anything you'd like to share, maybe that you've not shared before, anything to you know, the younger audience, anything about football, opportunities, you know, any, anything really? It's a very broad question. Yeah, um, I think there's opportunities all over the world to play football. It's a worldwide game. You've got to be willing to put yourself out there, take risks. But again, I think that comes from education and you know, learning the right things. Um, it's, a, it's a ruthless game. Coming to Australia, it's not the same as what it is in England. In Eng like a lot of players here, you know, they have to pay to play. So the clubs are gonna take you because essentially they want your money. Um, in England, it's complete opposite. They sign you if they like you, if they don't, they just get rid of you. It's a ruthless game, so being able to build those tools and all that to be able to deal with it, which I think Australians don't have, especially the young ones that go overseas. So going back to your point earlier about Australian football, they talk about formations, they talk about tactics, they talk about playing more games and all this stuff. They're missing a big chunk of it for me because then you see these kids, yeah, they know 4 3, three or whatever, but they go overseas. And one thing people don't realise is you go on trial and you play every game, of course you're going to play every game because you're a trialist and they want to see what you can do because they either want you or they don't. Yeah. Then you get signed and then you sit on the bench for the next six months. And people from Australia, they don't know how to deal with it. They don't know how to deal with failure, disappointment, um, getting injured, being on your own, moving away from home. So being able to learn those tools and techniques to actually stay there and make the right decisions instead of just impulses and things like that, I think is, is massive. Um, but being resilient and you know deciding if it's re really what you want, because like I said, and you guys know, it is ruthless. I think I heard you say the other day that not many people make it. We got told when we were growing up, you know, there's a big gate there, you're all sheep, 
when you're eight years old, everyone gets through that gate, you know, nice and cushy, everyone moves to the next age group under nines. By the time you get to under 18s, three of you get through that gate, the rest of you, who knows where you are. First team, one of you, if not zero of you, will get through that gate. And it is the harsh reality, and I think that's why we talk a lot about building people, and then the athlete second, because if you don't make it, these are life skills that you can take into any other area of your life and still be successful in, in something else. But if you do make it as a footballer, it's a bonus. So that's, that's what I think and what I've learned <laughs> over the Absolutely. past few years. Do you have any questions you want to ask, Kevin, in regards to anything? Um, I had one, but it's gone. <laughs> so it's okay. Crazy, that we we'll can come back. We can always edit the, the film and the thing, so yeah. It's no, it doesn't have to always flow. We can just press pause and yeah, chop it out. 100%. Is there anything that you'd like to talk about or be asked that we can include in this? Actually, before I forget it, okay. yeah, go on. He's <laughs> come back to me. <laughs> um, what's the biggest thing you wish you knew back then, like when you were in England at the good club, yeah. or even before you came to Australia, yeah. that you know now that potentially would have you starting every single early game right now or yeah. signing pro contracting? Uh, psychology, without a doubt, number one. If I had that, what I had now, I, would, I don't think I'd be in Australia by like playing the A-League. Yeah. And I think A-League's a great level, but obviously I was trying to get in that environment in England up there. If I would have had that, because I had some games where people watch me and go, you are unbelievable, you're brilliant. And the next four weeks they go, where's that, where's that kid gone? Where's that like amazing? I go, I don't know. So being able to have that in England and, you know, have that education for me and my parents because they would do anything they can to help me, I think I'd be in a different position in football terms. But I probably wouldn't change much looking back now because of the person that I've become. And I haven't left it too late, whereas I'm, I'm now playing professional football still and I've still got another 10 years left of, of playing. But if I can... Sorry, if we can educate younger players, parents, coaches, whoever it might be, and that's a big, big thing for me. Yeah, so psychology, you mean how to deal with things or how to keep your performance level high, confidence, all that type of stuff, or what? One yeah, I think see? it's a bit of everything. It's finding out what the individual actually needs. So, so for someone, it might be they just get really nervous on game day. Yeah. For another person, it might just be confidence. So it's knowing, kind of sitting down with someone and figuring out for me, you know, what it was, why I was so inconsistent and all that. And there's so many things that you can that you can look at. So that's why I think it's important to have a team, build a team around you who know what they're talking about and can give you those tools. But mindset, you know, you hear the word mental toughness every single day and coaches say they don't even know what it means. But, you know, kids don't know what it means. Yeah. So if I had that and could have built on confidence, you know, my match day, my habits building a balance and things like that, I think I would have been completely a completely different player. Very good. Next question for you. Last question, we can wrap it up. Uh, <laughs> talk to us about Kane Shepherd and talk, talk to us about pro-life performance. So obviously yep. that's your company, your new performance company. Yep. Um, and it's very much you. Yep. But talk to us about pro-life yep. and, and what that is and why that's sort of come about and how. Yeah, cool. So when I was in England, I got my first major injury. Um, it was cold, icy day, I went out for a header, no one around me. Done my ankle, done all the ligaments, done stuff like that, did normal rehab with the physios and stuff like that. Got released from that club and my ankle was still hurting. So I got recommended to this other coach and um, you know he looked at the body completely differently um, and it changed the way I looked at my own body and it really interested me because I saw how much it benefited my performances and I just wanted to learn more and more and everything I learn, I need to know why because otherwise I don't really like using it because I need to know why it benefits my performance. Um, and then I decided to move to Australia and I was semi-professional so I thought, what's my other interests? And I thought, well, strength and conditioning, you know, PT, whatever at the time. Went to uni for a bit, didn't really work out because I'm more of a, you know, practical learner like yourself. And um, I got qualified as a PT, and I just literally started doing courses, strength conditioning courses, rehab courses. Um, and not many people know this, but probably for the last three or four years, I would say until probably three months ago, 
I've been in chronic pain. And it's been from injuries that have been no fault of my own, from tackles and things like that. But as you guys know, you know, compensation and other things, you know, the body adapting and all that. Um, my body's just been in pain. So I've played in pain, you know, I've woke up in the morning just treading on eggshells because I don't know how much pain I'm going to be in, whether it be my feet, my groins, my hamstrings, my glutes. Um, and I enjoyed lifting heavy, but it got to a stage where I was doing strength conditioning, I was doing squats, I was doing deadlifts, and I felt worse. And I was in so much pain. So I go to training, I train, I just try any activation to make me feel good so I could train. I'd finish, I'd go home, and I wanted to go do the extra training, and I wanted to do the extra things, but I physically just couldn't. So I'd just do what I could in training, turn up for game, and um, that's what really led me down the rehab side of things. Um, and you know, injuries happen, whatever, but chronic pain is not something that's nice. Absolutely, um, that's, or normal. That's, <laughs> or normal, yeah, exactly, normal. But a lot of people think it is. Well, this is the Let's thing. Used to it. People, you know, when they say ignorance is bliss and we think it's a normal yeah. byproduct, sure, muscle soreness, fatigue. Yeah. Um, a lot of our clients, before we started doing what we do, yeah. um, you know, foam rolling, activation, yeah. release, um, mobility, all of this stuff to offload or to re-correct compensation or overload, that type of stuff, people were just mind-blown. Like we, yeah. before foam rolling became a thing, and I'm not saying foam rolling's the answer because it's not long lasting change. It's very <laughs> yeah, yeah. small. Yeah. It's, it's 1% of the, the, the whole picture. Yeah. But before I started doing a, a, literally a, a three-minute foam roll with teams, people were sore. You know, we, <laughs> the first club I worked at, we had 17 people on the bench for treatment. Yeah. Within the first six weeks, it was down to four people. Yeah. So if you can do your own, if you're educated and people are teaching the right types of self-care or maintenance or you know, recovery strategies, then you're going to limit your pains and symptoms and you're going to improve your performance. Yeah. And there's one thing I like what you're always preaching about is, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's you can only train as hard as you can re recover. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, and I learned that because when I first started strength conditioning and at the time I wasn't in chronic pain or whatever, I was still turning up to games and I was inconsistent still. You know, I was loving strength conditioning, I was lifting heavy, I was looking good, I was everything. But then as the more I learned, I started to realize I probably shouldn't do it on a Friday if I'm playing on the Saturday at three o'clock yeah. because my muscles, my coordination, everything, I was just fatigued. And I was thinking, why is this? This stuff supposed to help you. So then I started learning more about that, doing it at the beginning of the week, managing loads a bit more and stuff like that. So originally pro-life was started to be more of a rehabby strength conditioning kind of thing. Um, and everything that I know I've practiced on myself, I ask other people, I've got good teachers and always want to learn stuff. Um, and then I started, like I said, I've been in chronic pain for probably a few years and it hasn't been, been nice, but there were some days I'll still turn up and I'd still be able to perform, but then other weeks I wouldn't. So when I left Finland, I had to really figure out what it was because I was doing strength conditioning, I was doing speed work, I was doing everything, but I was like, Something's still still missing. And I was like, what is it? And then when I started learning about psychology and the brain and everything like that, my mind was blown. And I was like, if I can teach people this and educate some people in this and do all that as well. Um, and a lot of the stuff has to, you learn from other people online and stuff like that, but because you're a professional athlete or whatever and you move around a lot, sometimes it can be difficult to have that one coach that you really like all the time unless they do stuff online and things like that as well but as you know seeing people in person is different to seeing somebody online um so and i was moving around a lot of the time so i didn't really have that one person um like i had in england or whatever in australia it took me a while to find that and again i did strength conditioning courses and i was doing the squats the deadlifts the lunges whatever all the good stuff yeah. but i felt worse and that was the chronic pain but now I'm out of that and, you know, doing a lot more stuff with you and I've got out of that pain, I know how much benefit it has. Um, but again, it comes back to the individual and what, what they need and what their needs are. And um, that's pretty much why I started. Probably, that's, a, that's the short version. That's the short version. <laughs> that's the short version. The science <laughs> side, you're yeah. about to achieve and all of your experiences. Yeah. And how, how are you? 26. So 26 years of experience yeah. and, and reasoning and all of that stuff. But yeah, that was a great short version. Good, 